The topic of my presentation today is Restoring Biocultural Diversity, the Road to Language Health. In the United States, and I would guess that in much of the Western world, people are very much aware of endangered uh, species of plants and animals. So even young children hear about saving the whale, protecting the panda, and so forth. But I suspect that our uh, knowledge of uh, endangered languages and endangered cultures is a lot less. Since 1600, 7% of plant and animal species have been lost. While during that same period, 40% of the world's languages have been lost. Now, biological extinction will continue, no doubt. E.O. Wilson predicts an extinction rate of 27,000 species per year. But language death is predicted to skyrocket. Michael Krauss says 50% to 90% of the 6,000 languages currently spoken on Earth will die by the end of this century. So I have three purposes for this presentation. First, to make explicit the connections between biological and linguistic slash cultural diversity. And I'm using the term linguistic diversity, cultural diversity, more or less synonymously because I think that if a language dies, a culture dies. If a culture dies, a language dies. Second purpose is to emphasize that linguistic cultural diversity is as threatened and probably more so as biological diversity. And third, to offer reasons why we should care about maintaining all kinds of diversity. And because we're talking something about something biological and something more cultural, and we talk about death for both, I want to just discuss briefly the metaphor of death. Individual plants and animals die and return to the earth. This is natural and expected. Entire biological species can cease to exist. This is neither natural nor expected. Now, linguists use the death metaphor for the loss of a language, which happens when the final speaker dies. This is usually the result of some catastrophic event, such as war or disease. And this is neither natural nor expected. Next, I want to discuss the link between these two types of diversity. I think this is something that's not apparent, but it is real. Biological and linguistic cultural diversity tend to co-occur. It has been said that there is an intrinsic and causal link between them. Ten of the top 12 megadiverse countries for biological diversity are also among the top 10 for endemic linguistic diversity. There is the co-occurrence of the two types of diversity. Most of this co-diversity is found in the tropical areas of Africa, the Pacific, and Asia. The classic case of uh, diversity in both areas is Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, in a relatively small land area, has 860 languages of many different language stocks and language types. In addition, it's a land of dense tropical forests with numerous plant and animal species. Moffy claims that PNG's small culture groups and ecosystems may have co-evolved as humans depended on those ecosystems and then developed ways of talking about them. So the re result is there's a centuries-long symbiosis in relative isolation from the rest of the world. But in this modern day, this symbiosis, this co-diversity is threatened. Even once isolated areas, including Papua New Guinea with its uh, wealth in uh, copper and uh, other uh, products that the rest of the world wants, have been impinged on and destabilized. For example, coral reefs once harbored all kinds of sea life and fed local populations. But with overfishing 
the introduction of new technologies and the introduction of processed foods, reefs are deteriorating. What happens then to languages is they lose the words connected to the sea, to fishing and marine animals. The languages are changed. So we see that environment, culture and language are all adversely affected together. Well, we might ask ourselves why we need diversity. And as it turns out, the argument in favor of uh, both biological and cultural diversity is, is basically the same. Evans points out that if we had, say, just one banana type in the world, that type of banana would be susceptible to disease and thus susceptible to the loss of all bananas on the earth. Actually, an example of that can be seen in the uh, 19th century Irish potato famine where um, Ireland had just one type of potato, it uh, developed a disease, and the result was the death of many, many people. So we definitely need multiple varieties. In the language area, if we had just one language, be it Esperanto, uh, English, Mandarin, or whatever, that language would be susceptible to the thoughts and interests of those who knew the language best or who held the reins of power. There would no longer be languages that have been adapted to a specific ecosystem. I can't imagine an Australian Aboriginal talking about a specific type of grub that grows near a specific type of bush in Australia and using, say, Mandarin to talk about that. I have an additional argument against, uh, ag well, for language diversity and against the possibility of one global language or even a few global languages. And that is that speakers of languages have been known to intentionally change their languages in order to make them distinct from others. And I have two examples. One is uh, the Usi dialect of Buin on Bougainville Island in Papua New Guinea at some point flipped all its gender agreements, making the masculine ones feminine and the feminine ones masculine. Rotuman, which is a Polynesian language spoken in Fiji, at some point began to metathesize or reverse the final consonant and vowel in all lexical words. So the word hosa, meaning flower, became huas, and epa, meaning mat, became eap. And I would like to just ask, have us ask ourselves, why would people do such a thing, intentionally change their language, unless somehow there, there was this feeling that it was good to be different, it was good to be unique, it was not a positive thing to, to speak like everybody else. I'd like to continue to talk more about the island of Rotuma. It's the, um, the area that I do my research it's a small island about 350 miles off the uh, northwest of the main Fiji Islands. It's 17 miles in circumference. Uh, the reef there is uh, endangered. Lache Rotuma Initiative is a, a group in, Papua, in uh, Fiji which is trying to save the reef in Rotuma. And here's what they said in some of their literature. Our identity as Rotumans our traditional culture and way of doing things is intricately connected and cannot be separated from our natural environment and unique island biodiversity. Losing our biodiversity means loss of our livelihood, culture, and unique identity. So even this environmental group sees a close connection between the environment, in this case specifically the reef, and culture and identity. Rotuman was once a lush paradise, but now life is threatened by coastal erosion, reef deterioration, loss of knowledge of canoe building and fishing. Canned corned beef, called pot cow in Rotuman, which means a literally tinned cow, doesn't sound very good, is taking the place of fish in their everyday diets. Many traditional ceremonies are no longer being carried out. And the language? Well, the Rotuman language is unlike any other language. It, is, um, it has no near relatives. 
not even in the South Pacific. The language is central to Rotuman identity. The language has been affected by environmental changes. And just, I have one small example here. The word for small canoes, which are no longer being built, no, as are uh, the uh, um, large canoes, but small canoes are no longer being built, and the word for them, tavane, has been replaced by the generic uh, Polynesian word for canoe, laka. As Rotumans respond to the changes on their island and the lure of life overseas, many are leaving permanently. So today, only 2,000 people remain on the island, whereas at one time they had over uh, 3,200. Uh, and the island is the last bastion of everyday use of the Rotoman language, and this is why we consider Rotuman to be endangered. This is a global issue we're talking about, and it demands a global response. Fortunately, th there has been a response already. The World Wildlife Funds, uh, Fund, which we know as uh, being involved in uh, maintaining uh, biological diversity, in their approach to conservation, they also include cultural diversity. The International Union for Conservation of Nature is aiming for improved understanding of the synergy between cultural diversity and biological diversity. So they recognize this connection. UNESCO, which we think of as involved more in the culture side of things, they mentioned in their, ish, in their Universal Declaration on Cultural Diversity that cultural diversity is as necessary for humankind as biological diversity is for nature. So they see this connection. Terralingua is an organization which uh, has, uh, is concerned about both types of diversity, what they call biocultural, and that's really, I think, a, an apt word for what I'm talking about here. And they have created an index of biocultural diversity to try to promote all kinds of diversity. And one of the things that they have produced is this map, which shows the area of diversity in the world. The green shows the areas which have uh, uh, diversity of languages only. The yellow shows areas that have diversity of uh, uh, biological species, in this case vertebrates. And the red areas show areas that are diverse in both language and uh, biological species. So you see there are a lot of areas in which we have these types of diversity co-occurring. So what now? Uh, I, I want to just end this talk with a few suggestions, and really I, I, uh, the main one is education. I think if we can educate our children to be concerned about the environment, to care about the pandas and the whales and the, and the mountain gorillas, then we can teach them through books and films, through our parenting efforts, uh, about saving the Ainu in Japan, uh, the Mohawks in the United States, the Rotumans in Fiji. I believe we also should support local environmental efforts. I know that there are large environmental concerns and organizations and so forth, but I think in some ways it's the small efforts that are going to be uh, most useful um, in the long run, including those like the Lache Rotuma Initiative. We should be ecotourists, uh, visiting other lands, enjoying other cultures, uh, learning other languages, but not destroying uh, the, the lands that we visit. And finally, let's remember what Harmon says. Diversity in nature and culture makes us human. Thank you. <laughs>